Shall we record it? Is it okay but to record it, Jeff? Fine with me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you want me to send you the slides or something later, uh, just let me know. Sorry? If you want me to send you the slides later, just let me know. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we, we're going to need the slides. We'll send you an email. Great. So, so we are back with for the afternoon session of the last day of our LSST workshop, and uh, we now have uh, Jeff Newman. You are in Pittsburgh right now. Yeah, I'm in yeah. Pittsburgh. I'm at home. <laughs> okay, too bad you couldn't come. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very sorry. I've had back trouble this year, which has made it difficult to travel. So I really appreciate uh, you letting me do this remotely. Well, Je Jeff will tell, will tell us all we need to know about photometric redshift <laughs> in LSST. So please go ahead, Jeff. All Thank right. you. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Um, oops. There we go. Um, so I'm going to try to give an overview of, of both how we're going to do photometric redshifts for LSST or how we think we're going to do them, uh, but really focus on where there are open questions and things we need uh, that we don't have in place today to give you some idea of where uh, you might be able to step in and help with the problem uh, as well. Um, so I'm gonna start out by uh, giving an, an overview of photometric redshift methods for those who haven't uh, worked with them before. Uh, <clears throat> And then I'll talk about the problem of getting the spectroscopy we need uh, to train and calibrate those photometric redshifts so that we can get the dark energy and extra galactic you know, galaxy evolution science out of LSST. Um, then I'll focus on some open issues in photometric redshifts, things that I think are interesting avenues for research uh, in, the, in the upcoming years. Um, and then finally, I'll focus on some examples uh, of problems with current codes if we have time and just show you uh, where things are going wrong today uh, and where we might be able to do better. Um, so you should be familiar with uh, you know, the variety of probes LSST uh, will use to study dark energy. You've heard a lot about these at the workshop. Um, you know, the primary probes as we think of them generally are weak gravitational lensing baryon acoustic oscillations, type 1a supernovae, and cluster counts. Uh, strong lensing uh, adds information as well. All of these, you're measuring some observable as a function of redshift. The shear is a function of redshift for the gravitational lensing. The angular scale of the BAO feature for, uh, for BAO. For supernovae, it's the brightness of the supernovae. For cluster counts, it's how many clusters of a given mass or richness. Um, and so we want to have redshift information so we can do those tests. If we don't have the redshifts, we can't do those tests. However, um, if you think about doing this sort of the, the, the traditional way of going out with a telescope and getting a spectrum of an object, um, that spectrum gives you a redshift. We can determine how far back in the history of the universe we're looking uh, we can study galaxy evolution or cosmology by measuring some property as a function of redshift. But that spectrum requires taking the light from an object, splitting it up into to many pieces. Um, and so it gets very noisy when the object is faint because you're taking all that light and splitting it up as a function of wavelength into small wavelength bands. Um, so if you do the calculation and ask, at the depth of the samples we will use for LSST cosmology, which I'll use I of 25.3 uh, as a standard number there. Um, <clears throat> and you ask, how long does it take to get a redshift with uh, spectrographs we have today? Uh, it's about 100 hours on a 10 meter telescope. And it's important to keep in mind when you do that, you won't get a redshift 100% of the time. It'll be more like 75% of the time that you get a secure redshift that way. 
So if you say, well, you know, we can do better than those existing spectrographs. We can put a 5,000 fiber spectrograph on a 10 meter telescope. There are proposals like that. You still get a number of 50,000 years on that telescope to get a spectrum of every object in the LSST weak lensing sample. Uh, you know, we're talking 4 billion galaxies. That's just a lot. So this isn't how we'll generally do LSST cosmology. We have to do something different. Uh, unless you want to give us 50,000 10 meter telescopes and then we can do it in a year. Um, so the alternative is to do photometric redshifts. So in this case, we use the LSST imaging, which gives us measurements of the brightness of an object at different wavelengths, uh, and use the spectral features um, to determine the redshift. So we call this a photometric redshift because it's a redshift determined from brightness measurements or photometry. And so the advantage is we can apply this for every object in LSST. Uh, we just need you know, those six measurements of the brightness at six wavelengths. Uh, the disadvantage is it gives us a coarser redshift. As you can see in this uh, figure, this is an example of a photometric redshift. Uh, you have here five brightness measurements. And you, know, you can shift the wavelength of a galaxy template till it matches uh, the observations but you could wiggle that template a little bit and still be consistent. Uh, so we get a lower precision from photometric redshifts. And it's also gonna be the case that, you know, if your template's a little bit off, uh, the redshift you infer will be off as well. And so uh, there, there will be calibration uncertainties in the photometric redshifts, which for cosmology, we have to worry about and deal with. So it's also important to keep in mind that when we're applying photometric redshifts, we're looking for broad features in galaxy spectra that show up when you compile that spectrum with a filter. Uh, again, this is an example, a figure from Jim Dunlop. Uh, and so you see these strong uh, breaks, the Lyman break at the left, the Balmer break near the middle of this, the, this, uh, this plot. So when you have those breaks, when you have multiple breaks, you can isolate the redshift of an object pretty well. But if you look at the ensemble of galaxy spectra, uh, those breaks can be pretty weak uh, in some cases. So galaxies with old spectral populations have strong breaks, uh, strong uh, shape to their, to their spectral energy distributions. Um, but galaxies with younger populations, so the bluest curve, the curve in blue on this plot is the youngest population, uh, actually in, in F nu basically have a flat spectra. Uh, so if you redshift that spectrum, it basically looks the same at all redshifts till the, bomb, till, till the Lyman break enters your, your filter system. So photometric redshifts can be quite precise for red galaxies. And, you know, I, I have every confidence that we'll get 1% photosies for bright galaxies in LSST uh, that are red. Uh, we can do almost that well, even with relatively shallow imaging and just GR and Z uh, in the decal survey, uh, the DESI imaging. Um, for galaxies that are blue, it's a lot harder. Um, and so those will be the objects that give us trouble in training and in calibrating our photos. Um, so if we look at what we expect to do, uh, a variety of people have done simulations of how LSST should perform for photos. Uh, I'll be showing examples from Sam Schmidt. Uh, Melissa Graham is an, another example of someone who's been doing, uh, working on this actively recently. Um, these simulations are generally assuming that we perfectly know the intrinsic spectral energy distributions of galaxies. So in that case, as we'll talk about, the photo Z problem reduces to basically finding the right template spectrum and shifting that template to the right redshift and just finding where, where you have the best match. Um, and so if you do that, and if you have that perfect template knowledge, um, LSST should be able to give you 2% photometric redshifts, basically all the way from Z of zero to Z of three. Uh, this is determined just basically by the photon noise uh, and the fact that in some cases, uh, multiple redshift solutions can look as good as each other. So you can see those, we call them degeneracies generally when we talk about photo Zs. Uh, so along the X axis and along the Y axis, you have these regions that are off-axis where the uh, photometric redshift, which is the y-axis, 
is not matching up to the spectroscopic redshift, the true redshift of an object, which is shown on the x-axis. And so on these figures at right, I'm showing uh, in green uh, the requirements on LSST performance for real world photoses where we don't know perfectly the intrinsic template spectra of galaxies. Uh, and in gray is an estimate of where we need to be uh, with perfect template knowledge such that with imperfect knowledge, we'd achieve those green goals. And so we think we're going to do it. We think uh, that uh, if we had the knowledge of galaxies we have today, uh, we can get 5% photoses from LSST. So every object's redshift uh, is scattered basically by a Gaussian with sigma 0.05, with some fraction of outliers as well, which is plotted at the bottom, where you have a much larger deviation. But if you had that perfect template knowledge, and we're limited only by the random errors, then as Sam's simulations show, 2% photosies from LSST uh, would be quite feasible. Um, so we'd like to have those 2% photosies for reasons I'll talk about. Um, so when we talk about applying photometric redshifts, um, there are two basic ways we generally think of them. Um, one is what I'll call template fitting photoses. In this case, you use some set of galaxies that have a known redshift from spectroscopy um, to calibrate a set of underlying spectral energy distributions or templates as, as I'll call them. Uh, and calibrate the photometric band passes, the, the flux uh, admitted as a function of wavelength uh, for your actual filters. So in this case, we'll determine the posterior probability. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, so probability distribution for redshift, given the UGRIZY imaging from LSST. At the same time, uh, you determine which of the possible spectral energy distributions fits the object, not just which redshift. Uh, so that gives you information on galaxy properties. So in this case, we need spectra of galaxies over a wide range of properties so we can tune those templates, get them right. So we can get priors on redshifts based on magnitude alone before you consider the color. Uh, so you can tune zero points in photometry. Um, and in general, these algorithms perform well where they're tuned. Uh, so at left, I'm showing an example of uh, photoses from uh, Olivier Albert uh, performed with the CFHT LS data. Again, it's a plot of photometric redshift as a function of spectroscopic redshift. Uh, when you make this plot, uh, you know, most things are along the diagonal, which is where you'd hope you've got a small number of outliers. When you apply those same photometric redshifts, to the D2 data set, which has a different span in color space. It's weighted towards blue galaxies. Uh, different span in redshift. It's weighted more towards high redshift galaxies. You find a lot more things off the axis. Um, so when you, if you have incomplete coverage in the training set you use to optimize your template fit algorithm, uh, you will tend to have worse performance. So you want to have coverage across the full range of parameters have objects with spectra. Um, so the way we'll describe these measurements is generally with a redshift probability distribution. So for an individual object, we could just say, you know, the photometric redshift is two plus or minus 0.1. Um, but as you saw, there are those outliers. Um, there, there are objects that have much larger deviation between the photometric redshift and the spectroscopic redshift than you'd expect for something Gaussian distributed. So instead, uh, what more sophisticated codes do is they determine a probability distribution for redshift, where um, the statistical definition of a probability distribution is that the probability that the redshift is between two points, A and B, will just be the integral from A to B of that function, P of Z, as I'll call it, DZ. Um, so the higher P of Z is, the more likely you are to have a redshift near a given point. And then a second part of the statistical definition is that the integral of P of Z should be one. Um, so uh, on the top right is shown for a single object that's actually at redshift 1.33, uh, the probability distribution given by five different modern codes. Um, and all these probability distributions are derived from exactly the same imaging data and exactly the same training set. 
Nonetheless, you can see the algorithms disagree at some level. All of them are consistent with the true redshift of that object at 1.33, uh, but at varying levels. Um, so when I plot just a photometric redshift, a single number for an object, there are different ways of doing that. Um, one is choosing the peak of the probability distribution. One is calculating the expectation value of the redshift from that probability distribution, in some cases using only the highest peak. Uh, so there's lots of ways to choose a point statistic, uh, but the probability distribution itself, from a given code, there should only be one per object. Uh, it's just the probability of finding that object at a given redshift as a function of redshift. Um, we can get more sophisticated than that, and we can talk about um, getting the galaxy properties from a template fit as well as the redshift. Um, so uh, these, these triangle plots here are from a code called Beagle, uh, developed by Chevalier and uh, Charlot. Uh, that tries to fit the imaging. You can see that at upper right. It's trying to fit the measurements um, using basically a very broad grid of galaxy parameters. And then you can marginalize to get the probability as a function of redshift or as a function of intrinsic extinction or metallicity or whatever you like. And so I'm going to talk about this idea of having multidimensional distributions uh, where you're constraining not just the redshift, but either a template index, if you have a finite number of templates, or a galaxy parameter, like stellar mass or star formation rate, as the, prob the joint probability of redshift and alpha, where alpha here is a vector, potentially, of multiple things that should correlate with redshift uh, for a given fit. They have different degeneracies with redshift, uh, which we can exploit. Um, so the template algorithms basically have, uh, have two inputs. Um, the first part is given a set of templates. They determine the likelihood of the observed colors, uh, which by color, I generally mean the ratio of fluxes between bands, as a function of redshift and as a function of, of template. Uh, so this is plotted at top at the top here. For this is from uh, Chicho Benitez's BPZ paper. Um, so we have three different templates. Each of these templates gives us a different likelihood of getting the galaxy colors at a given redshift, uh, and those correspond to the different uh, line styles. Then we have a prior, which is the probability of given uh, of getting a given template type and redshift if you didn't know anything about the colors, just know about the magnitude. Uh, so the prior uh, is much broader here for things uh, with bluer uh, spectra, the irregular galaxies. Uh, it's more narrowly focused for the red galaxies. And then for each template type, we can take the product of the likelihood in the prior to get the posterior probability of the redshift given that template type. And then we can marginalize over template type to get the probability of the galaxy redshift given its color and magnitude. So that's the posterior. That's what I'm generally calling a P of Z. Um, so if we rewrite this in Bayesian language, uh, which is basically what I was using, so the likelihood is the probability of getting the observed fluxes given the redshift. Uh, we have a pr probability based only on magnitude, so that's the prior, uh, that doesn't take into account the observed colors. Um, and then we have a probability of the redshift given the observed colors or observed colors and magnitude. That's what we want, that's the posterior. And with Bayes theorem, we can relate these. So the probability of the redshift given the fluxes is the likelihood, the probability of the fluxes given the redshift times the prior divided by a normalization that we can just take the posteriors integral to be one to handle that. Um, so the, the training based photo, or sorry, the template based photo Z's are really, we think of as a Bayesian uh, estimate of the redshift. But there's a very different way to do, to do photometric redshifts. So training based photo Z's say, I don't know anything about intrinsic galaxy spectra. Um, I'm just going to try to come up with a mapping from observed colors and magnitudes 
to Redshift. And at this point, uh, there's lots of algorithms you can do that uh, with. Uh, you know, basically you can find dozens of machine learning algorithms that try to go from some set of inputs to an output and predict that output. Um, so this means you can take advantage of all the progress that's been made in machine learning and optimization for GPUs and all sorts of things uh, that have been done for other contexts. So that's a, a huge advantage. Um, the disadvantage of these training-based photos is, is they extrapolate very poorly. Um, the uh, machine learning algorithms are very good at learning what's in your training set. They're very bad at, at trying to go from what's in your training set to things that aren't like your training set. Um, so, you know, if you build a classifier that looks at images and says, is it a dog or a cat? You can get something that does very well at separating dogs from cats. Uh, but if you show it a, a horse, it's not going to know what to do with that. Uh, and we had the same problem in photometric red shows. Our spectroscopic training sets are incomplete. Uh, so if you show those machine learning algorithms, lots of examples of things we get red shows for, they're good at predicting red shows for things like those. But if you give it something that isn't like the training set, uh, those algorithms can perform very poorly. And so for these algorithms in particular, it's really, really important that your training set has to span the full range of properties and redshifts of the galaxies. Now, template-based methods, if you've got the templates right, you can extrapolate to other redshifts based just on the templates. Machine learning-based methods don't have that luxury. Um, so there's lots of algorithms you can use. Um, I won't go into detail. Lots of machine learning algorithms have been applied. Um, and for nearby galaxies, uh, where the training sets are basically complete, so you know, in the, in the limit of uh, things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, template-based methods that just use the magnitudes and machine learning-based methods that just use the magnitudes have very, very similar performance, similar scatter in the redshift, similar outlier rate, uh, which tells me that they're, they're using the same information. Um, and we're doing pretty well in that domain. Uh, when we start to go fainter, it changes a bit. Um, and for LSST, we're going to be going faint. <laughs> so we have to worry about this. Um, so what I'm showing here are a couple plots from a student of mine, Rong Pujou, uh, who has built an empirical data set uh, that's LSST-like in its depth. It's got CFHT legacy survey imaging and UGRIZ, uh, deep Subaru imaging in the Y band. Uh, we've got redshifts from deep two and deep three and 3D HST. Um, and it left is how a, uh, a fairly standard template code called easy performs. Um, you can see examples of those degeneracies that we saw in the LSST simulations. For instance, there's a tendency for objects at Z of 0.3 to be assigned redshifts between two and a half and three, which is not good. Uh, those are very different in distance. Um, so you can see also regions of parameter space, these spurs that occur due to degeneracies and colors. So in Rongpu's paper, he also applies a much simpler algorithm, a machine learning algorithm uh, called random forest regression, uh, where you get you know, better performance uh, by most statistics, but that performance would not extrapolate at all. So, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind. So whereas at low redshift, the performance of training and template-based photos is basically matches, at high redshift, um, you know, if you do a test, odds are the training-based methods will win, but part of that is because, uh, you're not extrapolating when you look at, at objects like your training set. Um, so I should pause here and ask if there's any questions before I move on to the next part of my talk. Okay. Uh, so uh, the um, next part of my talk is gonna focus on the spectroscopic part of the problem. Because if we had complete spectroscopy, then we could apply these machine learning methods and have sort of ideal photos all over the place. 
uh, and you know, take it easy. Um, so the question is going to be how close to that ideal spectroscopy can we get? Um, so there's two uh, ways I think of the application of spectroscopy for photosynthesis. Um, one is what I call training. So by training, I mean using objects of known redshift um, to optimize your algorithms. Um, so that'll shrink the errors on individual objects. It'll bring the photosynthesis closer to the spectroscopic Zs. The better your knowledge of galaxy SEDs or the better the training set you have, for, um, for the training based methods. And so an illustration of the power of that is this plot from Chichio Benitez, where on the top you see uh, a map of galaxy redshifts from a particular region of a simulation uh, where 3% photo Z errors have been applied. In the middle, the errors have been shrunk by a factor of 10, so 0.3%. It's a lot easier to see the web of large scale structure as those photo Z errors get smaller. It's not as easy as the bottom panel where it's showing what, what you get with zero photo Z errors. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of information that's available in that middle map that isn't there in the, the top map. So the better we can make the individual object errors, so the better our training of algorithms is, the closer we will be to that middle map instead of the top map. Um, and so if you could do that, uh, you'd greatly increase the science we get out of LSST. Um, so basically, um, the as I showed you before, um, the requirement for LSST photo disease is 5%. Uh, with today's training sets, we get in that neighborhood. But if we had a perfect training set, so if we had perfect template knowledge, as in Sam Schmidt's simulations, we'd have 2% photosynthesis. And so this plot is showing basically one over the DETF figure of merit for dark energy experiments um, for different amounts of photo Z error. Um, and so for BAO, you can see there's a strong dependence of the power of the test on error. For weak lensings, it's relatively shallow. And when you put them together, you have something in between. So put together the dark energy task force figure of merit is about 40% higher if you had the perfect training set photo Z errors, so 2% photo Z errors, than if you had the photo Z errors we get today in LSST like data sets, more like 5%. So of course, we'd like to be at that 2% level. Um, so we want spectroscopic training data to pin down those templates so we can get to that 2%. Um, the other need for spectroscopy I'll call calibration. And so um, training is reducing uh, the spread in our estimate of the redshift of a given object. Calibration is the problem of characterizing how different is the estimated redshift of an object from the true redshift? And we need to characterize both the mean shift between our photo Zs and the true Z and the spread between a photo Z and a true Z very accurately. If we say our photo Z errors are 2% and really they're 2.1%, um, that would be a big enough difference that we get all the dark energy wrong with LSST. Um, so we need to do this very, very well to get the dark energy constraints right. Um, that I think is possible, but uh, it requires uh, care to, to do this. And so if you had a set of objects with photo Zs, you could get spectra for a large number of them and just ask on average, how different is the mean? What is the spread of the estimated redshift compared to the true redshift? And you could get that calibration information from the objects with spectroscopic redshifts. But that only works if you have complete spectroscopy. If you have uh, spectra for 99% of the objects, but the other 1% are systematically different, that systematic difference is enough to, um, to, uh, to, to cause your calibration to be wrong. 
And we expect the things that we don't succeed in getting redshifts for are systematically different than the things we do. Uh, they have different spectral energy distributions. Um, so if we ask what do we need in terms of data to do the photometric redshift training for LSST, uh, I led a white paper uh, a, a, a few years ago uh, that tried to estimate what we want. Um, and the first and foremost goal is we need extremely secure spectroscopic redshifts. I'll explain why they need to be secure in a moment. Uh, for something like 20 to 30,000 galaxies, over the full range of galaxy colors, magnitudes, and redshifts you'll use for your dark energy inference. Um, so at least it's 20 or 30,000 and not 5 billion. Uh, nonetheless, this turns out to be a pretty expensive observing program. Um, so if we put it together, we want to go down to the LSST weak lensing magnitude limit. So I of 25.3, that's very faint uh, for current surveys. Uh, ideally, we want to have uh, a significant number of separately rated fields on the sky. Uh, the ideal case would be at least 15 of them, at least 20 arc minutes in diameter. Uh, that's big enough that the sample cosmic sample variance should be reduced. So the field to field variation of redshift distribution should be reduced. Uh, 15 is enough you can quantify whether a given field is unusual at a given redshift. And so this is, uh, gives you the same cosmic variance as the survey being done to train photosies for Euclid, uh, the C3R2 survey, but it's like a quarter of the sky area. So it's four times more efficient to program if you split it up into more fields distributed over the sky. Um, so unfortunately, it turns out if you want to go to I of 25.3, you need to expose for a long time in a telescope. So the plot here is showing the fraction of objects we've got a secure redshift from, from deep two or Z cosmos, as a function of the I magnitude of an object. And so deep two at I of 22.5 had about 75 to 80% of the time we'd got a secure, a secure redshift from an object. So if you extrapolate, uh, you know, if you just say, I want to get the same signal noise as deep two achieved, uh, but do it for I of 25.3, that becomes not one hour at Keck, but four nights at the GMT. So that top scale is showing you the equivalent uh, uh, magnitude from a four night exposure time at GMT. And you can see, you know, you can reach that 80% at I of 25.3, it requires bigger telescopes and longer exposure times. So that's what makes this program expensive. Um, so why do we need very secure redshifts? So I'm illustrating that here, um, showing you what is the, the bias in your, or the calibration uncertainty on the photo Z bias uh, in bins of redshift. Uh, for a sample where you took 100,000 spectra and do, did direct calibration. Um, so the black curve is showing the results of that. It meets the LSST requirements, except at the lowest and the highest redshifts. But if you put in that half percent of your spectroscopic redshifts are wrong, then you're only meeting that requirement barely and in a very limited redshift range. Most surveys have classes of, of redshifts that they estimate are half percent incorrect, 5% incorrect. Uh, and something like Z Cosmos, you put those together and you expect a net failure rate of something like 2.75%. If you have that failure rate, then you're going to violate the calibration requirements by a large factor. So you need to use only the most secure redshifts. You need to be sure you have multiple features and that those features are real if you're using those redshifts to calibrate photoses. That's important to keep in mind. So um, if you look at that survey I laid out for training and calibrating photoses, you can look at a variety of telescopes you could imagine doing this with. Um, so uh, I'm listing a number of examples here. I've marked out uh, the fiber version of the wide field optical spectrograph on TMT because that's not happening. Uh, these others are things that are at least possible. Um, 
So most of these uh, you may have heard of Foremost, Desi and Weave are all wide field surveys uh, coming on sky in the next few years. Those are real projects. Uh, Lassie is an idea to do something like the Subaru PFS instrument, but put it on Magellan. Uh, PFS is coming online in a couple of years. Moons is coming on the VLT soon. Uh, Demos is the workhorse spectrograph on CAC. Phobos is an idea for a higher multipl multiplex spectrograph on CAC. Spectel and MSE are two different concepts for telescopes a little bit larger than CAC that are optimized for wide field of view, highly multiplex spectroscopy, uh, which is great for the photo Z training case. And then we have the, uh, the 20 to 30 to 40 meter telescopes at the bottom. If you look at how long it takes to do those surveys for the photo Z training, uh, we can focus on the first column. Um, it takes a long time with a 40 meter telescope because you're going so fast. PFS, it would take about a year of dark time. And that's a lot, but you could spread it out over the 10 year life of LSST. And then it's you know only a month a year. Um, Demos, again, because of the small field of view, it's difficult to do this survey. Uh, the wide field spectrograph telescopes like ESO and MSC, uh, ESO Spectel and MSC are pretty efficient at this. It's like six, seven months. Uh, the large telescopes, um, TMT is not so effective for this. Uh, EELT is not so effective for this because you'd have to do separate setups in the optical and infrared. It would take you about two years. Uh, but the GMT telescope with the manifest fibers feed um, is pretty well suited for this project. It takes you about as much time as Bechtel or MSE. Uh, but in this case, GMT, we have more confidence is happening. The others are concepts that aren't currently funded. Um, so if you can get complete spectro spectroscopy, so if you try to get a redshift in 100% of the time within the, the parameter range of your dark energy sample, or at least 99.9% .9 of the time, you get a secure redshift, um, then you can meet the LSST calibration requirements with your training set. If not, you need to rely on other techniques. And uh, so my expectation is our final calibration for LSST will come from cross-correlation techniques. The basic idea there is we know that galaxies of all different types cluster together because they're all tracing the same dark matter distribution uh, fundamentally. Um, so if you take advantage of the fact that things in large spectroscopic surveys like DESI and the objects that you only have photometric registers for in LSST are tracing the same web of dark matter, you can actually reconstruct redshift distributions via the correlations between spectro spectroscopic objects and photometric objects in the sky. Sometimes this is called clustering redshifts. Uh, so I wrote the first paper on this back in 2008. Um, so for LSST, the requirements are we want at least 100,000 objects spread over at least 100 square degrees or multiple 100 square degrees fields. Uh, spanning the full redshift range of LSST. And with DESI, uh, we should be able to meet that requirement. The estimates are, you know, something like 500 square degrees of overlap with DESI uh, would be good. Uh, with 3,000 square degrees of overlap with DESI, we meet the LSST requirements at all but the lowest redshifts. And for dark energy, if you had to exclude everything at Z less than 0.2 from your weak lensing analysis, uh, because you didn't have a good calibration there, it's negligible impact on the figure of merit. It's not where the information is coming from in LSST. So you're quite content to throw out everything at low redshift if you had to. So there's plenty of signal here. Uh, there's gonna be work to put things together, but, uh, but my expectation is that this is how we'll get our ultimate calibration for LSST. Um, so any questions about spectroscopy for photo Zs before I turn to open issues? the last bit of the talk. Okay. Yep. So um, the final thing I'll be talking about then is uh, uh, problems with photo disease or open questions. So the first problem is one I talked about before, this problem of incomplete training sets. Um, 
So better methods of dealing with these incomplete training sets could enhance your photo Zs. Um, so whether this is you know, methods of sort of interpolating between the training set using templates or excising parts of color space that are not effective. Um, so uh, the problem of having mistraining is also a big issue. Um, if you had a 1% incorrect redshift rate, uh, as I showed, uh, you'd get an incorrect calibration of your photosis. Um, so in some surveys, the incorrect redshift rates are as high as 5%. So if you include those in your training set, you will mistrain your algorithm. One could imagine though, having uh, algorithms which are robust in the statistical sense, which means have some fraction of the input data be completely wrong and still learn to give you a reasonable redshift. Um, that's not the case today, but I think it would be an interesting thing to think about uh, how can you create uh, training-based algorithms uh, that are, are robust to, to those incorrect redshifts. Um, that would allow you to use broader spectroscopic training sets. You could have a set that's 10% of the time it's wrong and get the right information out. That would be really powerful. Um, uh, so developing machine learning algorithms that extrapolate better, uh, which I think the easiest way to imagine doing that would be machine learning algorithms that within them effectively build uh, knowledge of galaxy spectral energy distributions and how those those change with redshift um, could also be an interesting and powerful tool. Um, another problem is that the posterior redshift distributions we get from algorithms, so these P of Zs, um, do not generally meet the, uh, the, the statistical definition of a P of Z. And what I mean by that is that if those are proper probability distributions, 68% of the time, the true redshift of an object should be in the middle 68% of the distribution. And 95% of the time, the true redshift should be in the middle 95% of the distribution. If you look at results for a variety of codes that have reasonable performance at, at, at sort of point statistics, simple redshift estimates in the candle survey, um, very few of those codes come at all close to having well calibrated uh, P of Zs. Um, so for example, you know, here's code 12i that 89% of the time you're in the 68% interval, 97% of the time you're in the 95% interval. So 97% isn't far off, but 89% is really far from 68%. And so the question of how do we take imperfect photo Z outputs and turn, make, turn them into better redshift distributions is an interesting one. Uh, so I'll talk, uh, if we have time, about some work that's happening in the LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration characterizing these problems. Um, so work we've done in candles, uh, so this a student of mine, Jatan Kodra, has worked on this, is asking, can we kludge the set of imperfect probability distributions from candles so we have something that looks good in the end? And the answer turns out to be we can do pretty well. Uh, so the idea is we take the individual P of Zs and we modify them in a few ways. We allow for a shift uh, in the redshift direction, so a lower redshift or a higher redshift. We allow for a convolution with the Gaussian kernel, which can make features broader. Uh, we allow for taking the redshift distribution to a power, um, so which is equivalent to, if you're doing a chi-squared calculation, equivalent to multiplying all the errors by some factor and then calculating chi-squared. So it'd be saying that photometric errors are miscalculated. Um, and then we can minimize uh, the, uh, we can optimize these parameters by minimizing the distance between the curves that you see on this plot and the diagonal. So the plot here is what's known in statistics as a QQ plot or quantile quantile plot. So it's showing as a function of uh, different quantiles, so different, uh, uh, a percentile is an example of a quantile that you know, comes every percent. So the 0.2 quantile uh, corresponds to what, uh, to 
what uh, um, the value that 20% of things are below. Um, so if you take the true redshift and ask what is it, it's uh, quantile in its probability distribution, you would expect those true redshifts to be distributed uniformly between zero and one. So 1% 1 of the time you're between zero and 0 0.01, 1% of the time you're between 0.99 and one. So those quantiles should be uniformly distributed. And that uniform distribution gives you a diagonal on this plot where you compare as a function of uh, how far into the cumulative distribution function you are, what fraction of values are below that. Um, and so in the data, you can see large deviations, especially in the black curve where you've done no manipulations. So in the blue curve, we apply a shift to all the POZs that brings things closer to the ideal case. In the red curve, we do a convolution as well. And in that case, uh, we're able to do quite well on this quantile quantile plot. So we've taken probability distributions that were far from the stati statistical definition, that didn't have anything close to 68% of the data and the, uh, of the redshifts in the middle 68%, to something that does have close to 68%. Um, and so, uh, the black and red curve points here show how um, how um, uh, uh, the uh, different algorithms in uh, in the candles data set from Dalen uh, uh, perform on on two key statistics. So the outlier fraction, the fraction of things that are that are far from the estimated redshift when you look at their true redshift and the RMS, basically I measure the photos of the error. And so we wanna be at the bottom left of this plot. And what Dahlin found is if you take the, the five best codes, which are the red points, uh, and take their median or their mean uh, of their estimated redshifts, you get a performance that's better than any single code. Uh, so this suggests we can do better on getting photos these by just running multiple codes and defining the results even with the same photometry. All these codes are working on the same photometry. So what this really means is that the current codes aren't optimally making use of the information available. They're failing at different times in different ways, but by combining results, we can sort of average out those failures. Um, so in Dahlin et al, we, we presented a hierarchical Bayesian or Bayesian mixture model method for combining not point estimates like mean redshifts, but P of Zs. Uh, so we could get a combined P of Z that hopefully performs better than an individual P of Z. Um, so that was one method. Uh, Izbiki and Lee uh, presented uh, a method using weighted combinations of codes, which has different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so Drijitan Kodra has applied a, a third method of choosing a consensus PDF for multiple codes, um, which looks at what's called the Frechet distance. So the Frechet distance is illustrated in this plot here. So we have two different PDFs, the red and green curve. Um, and we can add up the distance in the Y direction between the two curves uh, over all redshifts. Uh, we could add them up, just sum up the absolute values or sum the squares uh, to get a distance between them. And so two curves that are very similar to each other will have a very small Frechet distance. If they're very different from each other, they'll have a large Frechet distance. So if we choose out of a set of PDFs, the PDF that has the smallest Frechet distance from all the others, that's analogous to choosing the median out of a set of numbers. The median of a set of numbers minimizes the sum of the absolute values of the difference between that number and, and the others in an array. Here, we minimize the Frechet distance between curves. Um, sorry, someone's knocking at the door. Um, they just went away. Um, sorry about that. Um, so just to illustrate how this works, this is that same object I showed you before, five different estimates of the redshift. Um, if we calculate the consensus redshift with the hierarchical Bayesian method, uh, we get the black curve, which you can see is tighter than the individual curves. Peaks pretty close to that redshift 1.3. Um, and then the red and green points are showing two different versions of the minimum Frechet distance, depending on whether you use an absolute value distance or a square distance. Uh, 
So in this case, different curves get chosen. And so you're trying to choose the single PDF that re best represents the ensemble. And so what Dratan has shown is choosing a PDF by the Frechet distance uh, performs a little better than any of the individual PDFs when you look at, at statistics and performance. And so this is showing just those consensus estimates. The hierarchical Bayesian is giving you the tightest P of Z. Uh, the Frechet distance can be no tighter than the individual P of Z. Um, so a related problem is if you have multiple redshift, multiple algorithms, sometimes these algorithms have very different failure modes. And you can see that in these same plots I showed you before of uh, the photo Z performance with the easy code as opposed to random forest regression. These objects that are up, uh, you know, the, the, that, that are up at, at near Z of three that are really at Z of 0.3 with easy are not there in random forest regression. So you could have identified those as problem objects just by running both algorithms and asking, are the results near each other? And the answer would be no. So having multiple algorithms and comparing could be an interesting way to find failure modes uh, that has started to be explored, but more work could be done. Um, another problem uh, that I think is interesting to think about for the future is if we had multidimensional redshift distribution, so probability not just of redshift, but of redshift and galaxy properties, um, P of Z alpha, as I called it, how do we store that? Storing a P of Z can be kind of expensive if you want to store the probability of, of an individual redshift at every 0.01 from Z of 0 to 10, that's a thousand numbers per object. If you say you want to store not just redshift, but stellar mass, imagine you have a grid of only 100 stellar masses. It now becomes 100,000 numbers per object. The LSST databases don't have anything like that number for that amount of grid. So there's been work, uh, Carrasco, Kind, and Brunner is an example, where they've been able to compress PDFs so they only need something like 20 values or 10 values um, to represent the overall PDF, if you choose smart ways of compressing, can we do this with two-dimensional PDFs? Uh, I don't know. Um, that's an open question and an interesting one. Uh, so that that there is work to be done in that area. Um, so how do we optimize these spectroscopic training sets uh, is also a question. Uh, so. Uh, the state of the art there is really the work done uh, by Dan Masters et al, uh, where they set up a self-organized map of galaxy colors and try to then target for spectroscopy the points that are what least well studied in that map. But there's certainly room in the, in the machine learning community, there's lots of techniques uh, for how do you optimize choosing the next object based on what you've learned from all the others to be most informative that hasn't really been carried over yet. Um, so uh, actually, this is illustrating from the self-organized map just how little that map is actually filled in with high confidence redshifts right now. So there's a lot of work to be done in these training sets uh, to still. Um, so if I look ahead and think about how will we do photometric redshifts for LSST, um, the, what I think the picture might look like is hopefully we will have these 30,000 spectra. I'm trying and with many different groups to advocate for this. Uh, you know, if, if you are involved in any uh, telescope projects that could do it, uh, I'd encourage you to, to advocate for this. I'm happy to talk about uh, what would be useful. Uh, the surveys we want are very interesting galaxy evolution surveys as well. So it is possible to get broader communities involved. Um, so I think we'd have this large training set. Um, We'd develop our priors and tweak our templates uh, through hierarchical Bayesian methods, where we try to determine uh, modulations of the templates to better match the data uh, purely empirically. Um, we would take into account the fact that for LSST, the effective filter system varies with observation. Um, for instance, at, uh, in the U filter, depending on how much air mass you're looking through, how close to the horizon you're looking, the effective throughput of that filter changes. Um, 
And so if you take that into account fully, that would be like doing the photo Z with a thousand measurements, each individual visit instead of six measurements, you know, just the individual measurements. Uh, but you're gaining some information from the fact that the effective filters are different in each measurement. Um, something we'll need to have eventually is some sort of AGN classification and photometric registers for active galactic nuclei. Uh, it's an interesting problem because their colors are not stable over time. Their colors are variable. Uh, and most photo Z codes do not like that. Um, we want the photo Z codes to be fast, especially if we want to look at these multidimensional P of Z alphas. Uh, we don't want an algorithm that takes an hour per object. So I think where we might end up going is basically machine learning based emulators for template based photo Z's, where you develop a template based algorithm. If you've done that, you can generate an arbitrary training set from your set of templates and red shifts and your priors. Um, so you would generate training sets of millions of objects that you feed to the machine learning algorithm and then very rapidly run the machine learning algorithms. Um, and then for, uh, for very bright objects, there'll be lots of things that go wrong and having a lot of algorithms that can show up those problems, I think will be useful. So it looks like we're at the end of the time. So I'm gonna skip the last part of my talk, uh, just move to a conclusion slide. Uh, key takeaways, number one, the training-based methods are much easier to get good results from. The random forest technique that Ron Cujo is running is like five lines of Python. And you know, easy is probably thousands of lines of code. But the training-based methods don't extrapolate well. So you need to keep those trade-offs in mind. Uh, the spectroscopic training sets are going to be a key problem for LSST uh, and currently an unsolved one. We're pushing on this every way we can. Um, we'll see where we get. Uh, I would say there's lots of interesting problems in PhotoZ to work on for the near future. I've tried to give some ideas. Get in touch with me if you're interested in pursuing any of these further. Um, and finally, you know, I, I've presented a lot of things that you know aren't great. But with the current codes, we should be able to meet the LSST requirements. LSST will be a stage four dark energy experiment. We can do better uh, with better information. I'm hoping we'll be able to do that. And that's really where we're pushing is uh, how to do that. So, uh, so uh, that, that, that uh, I've reached the end. So thank you very much. And uh, I should ask if there's any questions. Thanks, Jeff. So, questions? Hi, Jeff. I have a, thank you for the talk. I have a, I have a question uh, about uh, combining the different um, redshift algorithms. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a question of the time it takes to do this for a billion galaxies. Because you have to, do, you have to measure then the redshifts for each galaxy five times. And uh, is that... Is that uh, obstacle so, to this? So I'm not so worried about that. Um, so five times, um, I think the codes, simple codes, one dimensional codes are fast enough that you could definitely do that on the computing facilities we'll have for LSST. If you had to do it 5,000 times, that would be a problem. But five, I'm not worried about. Okay. Anyone? Well, if I, I have a question, can you mm -hmm. quickly revisit the the calculation for the fifty thousand years telescope? Uh, telescope? Sure. What? Yeah, what? Uh, so how? 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 How do you get there? What yeah, sort so of exposure time and? So the the exposure times are more than a hundred hours per object. If you say you're doing uh, five thousand objects at a time, so first of all, let's say it's four billion, five billion galaxies. 5,000 objects at a time takes you to 1 million pointings. Uh, 1 million pointings times 200 hours per pointing is, is, is about right, uh, more closer than 100 hours. So it's then 200 million hours. Uh, so getting that tonight, there's about five hours per night. Uh, so it's... Uh, 40 million nights, 
So divide by 400 to get years, that would give you 100,000 years. So yeah, well, yeah, very crudely, I ended up with a factor two different. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's probably, the difference is probably assuming 100 hours versus 200 hours per month. My, my latest calculations are closer to 200 hours. Cool. Well, that's, that's a bit of time. Yes. <laughs> we won't get that. No one will give me that much time. <laughs> More questions? No? Three, two, one. Well, it seems people are satisfied. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you. And again, uh, get in touch with me after if you have any questions or want to follow up on anything. Sure. So. Or and drop your your Slack. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm always on. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chef. Bye. bye bye. Henrique, so you're concerned that no one would be here, so. <laughs> Let's uh, minimize. Ah, I think we can do it. Let's Não sei se o Jack vai ficar assistindo. Se ele tivesse, ele vai. Não vai, né? De quem? Rogério. Você sabe de quem é esse pendrive aqui? Pode, pode tirar? Vamos tirar ele aqui. Esse daqui, né? Pronto. Hello. É essa aqui? É assim. um laser, mas não, tá, não deve estar tá passando para lá. Não. Ixi. Tá bom, entrou.
Okay. Last but not least, we'll have a hit Xavier. We'll talk about stellar contamination, is that right? Yep. And, and is the tropic selection effects on large photometric surveys. So let's well, get, ri get rid of stars. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> so I changed the title a bit, uh, and the paper I just put it on archive, so you can check it out as well. Uh, so basically the idea is we have to, well, to measure cosmological parameters from galaxy distribution, you, can, you have to go like from a map of the uh, galaxy distribution on the sky, or sometimes you have redshift information, and you have to go to some kind of statistics, right? So here I'm showing the, the angular power spectra, and here are the, the three-dimensional power spectra. And, well, basically, this is the, what we have to do. And, um, and one thing that I, I, I so I, I kind of focused on a white supercosmos, which is this map here I'm showing. So you can see it's a full sky survey. And I focus, focused on that because I was interested in trying to get information from the largest scales, right? And the reason is that, well, usually in most cases they are ignored because of systematics that affect the larger scale, so people just throw it out, but there is information there. And moreover, there are certain uh, effects that uh, only appear on the larger scales, right? So for instance, uh, uh, Ruth Durer published a paper showing that if you have threshold biasing, that's it, if galaxies only form on regions uh, where density contrasts goes above a certain threshold, then you get a distortion on your power spectrum. So here you see the original matter power spectra, and this is the, will be the tracer power spectra. So you see a nonlinear bias here on small scales, but you also see deviation on the larger scales, right? So this would be an interesting effect to try to check. Uh, another thing that is well known is that uh, nonlinear um, actually non-Gaussian, uh, uh, primordial non-Gaussian features uh, from inflation can also induce a bias, a scale-dependent bias on your tracers. Also, uh, depending on if you, if you have a exotic uh, uh, dark energy that can cluster on large, uh, large scales, or if you have modified gravity that changes uh, how the structure grow, and you, you can have different redshift space distortions. On the, and this shows on, uh, on the CLs, on the angular power spectra, on the larger scale. So this is what motivated me to try to push the boundaries of the observations to, so we can uh, extract information from the larger scales where systematics contaminate, right? So basically, so as I was saying, galaxy surveys, they suffer from several systematics. Uh, so here I'm just listing like the main astrophysical, or sorry, the main uh, observational systematics we have. So extinction from the galaxy uh, seen, so the atmosphere blurs your observations. And I'll focus here on stellar density. So the basic, one of, I, one of the things about stellar density influencing your uh, galaxy surveys is shown here by a paper by Waras uh, using uh, BOSS galaxies. So you can see that it shows that the number density of galaxies, so this is for spectroscopic samples. So the number density of galaxies decreases as you go to regions where you have more uh, stars, right? And of course, this is not a cosmological effect. Uh, this is because uh, uh, stars uh, make it more difficult for you to observe galaxies. They get in the way, they, they are bright and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so, but spectroscopic surveys, they don't have contamination because since you can uh, observe the spectra of the, of the objects, you know for sure that that's a galaxy, right? But that's not the case for photometric surveys. So for photometric surveys, you have contamination. And this is a plot uh, for DES. Okay, and you can show it, they can uh, separate, st so this is stellar, uh, stellar, in star galaxy classification, you have the purity of your galaxy sample here as a function of redshift. And you can see it can do reasonably well, or actually quite well, you can get to 1% contamination, but still there is some contamination there, right? And, um, Okay, and another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, photometric, uh, photometric uh, surveys, they don't have just contamination, they have also contamination. So the effect of obscuration is there as well. So you cannot get rid of this kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
So I'll demonstrate first demonstrate these effects with the Y supercosmos. So here I'm showing again the same map I showed before of the sources. You can see I just masked the galaxy, the, our, our own galaxy here. This line separates uh, two uh, equatorial hemispheres. So you have the northern equatorial hemisphere here and the southern here. And so the Y supercosmos is uh, actually a combination, is a photometric catalog, photometric redshift catalog of galaxies that combines photo photometry from the WISE uh, satellite, which is uh, uh, observation of infrared, and the cosmos, which is uh, actually scanning, uh, digitalizing of uh, photographic plates of, that were taken in the optical, okay? Uh, so if you combine these two, you have four bands, you can do, uh, you can do uh, photo Z estimation. So you, here you have the photo Z distribution of the galaxies in this, in this sample. And uh, it goes up to redshift point 35 here. And uh, so, and I, to do the, the analysis, I did the, like tomographic bins. So you can see this, these colored bands here are the photo Z bins I used, and these lines are the spectroscopic uh, distribution expected for each one of the bins. So there you can see that the photo Z bin, the photo Z errors are like something like uh, 0.03. So you get this kind of broad, uh, broad distributions here. Another thing it's important, important to point out is that there is contamination in the sample. So it's basically constant. So the stars distribute in, in, in redshift basically const, uh, in a constant way. Uh, and of course, galaxies don't have photo Zs, but uh, they, as they get confused by galaxies, they get assigned photo Zs and they just distribute it uh, like that. But since the total number of objects decreases, for instance, in this uh, bin, the fraction of uh, uh, contamination is higher in here, reaching to 6%. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay, so so to demonstrate this, uh, these two effects, uh, which is the, the fact that you lose galaxies when you, when you, because of stars, which is called obscuration and the contamination, what I did was to cross-correlate this, or ac actually cross-match uh, the Y supercosmos sources with SDSS photometric class, uh, uh, sources, right? And SDSS classification is much better because of the PSF, PSF is much better uh, in SDSS than in Y supercosmos. So I can, I use the class, SDSS classification as a true table. So when you cross match with SDSS uh, objects classified as stars, you can see that you get a, uh, a higher density of objects near the galactic plane, right? So it shows that contamination in this, uh, in this sample. And when you cross match with SDSS galaxies, you see uh, objects all over the sky, but you can see a decrease uh, near the, the galactic plane, right? So this is the obscuration effect, right? You're losing uh, galaxies as well. And you can see that basically it's the same regions where you have an increase in, uh, in stars is where you get a decrease in, in galaxies, right? Okay, so to move this, I'll use this simple uh, model. So they observed that this is the number of observed sources in the sky. I can add, and this S here is a stellar template, a stellar density template, and I can just modulate, uh, rescale this by a certain uh, parameter here, and I can rescale also the obscuration by another parameter, and this is the true galaxy uh, density, okay? So this is the model I want to in, uh, play, uh, use, and uh, one thing to note is that I use the same template for the contamination and the same template for the obscuration effect. Another thing is that I use the same template for both uh, all redshift uh, bins. Okay. So how the problem, okay, so you, you have this model, the thing what you really wanna do is to get this number here, and the problem is that you have to estimate alpha and beta, right? And how people have done it so far, uh, basically, for instance, in spectroscopic surveys, you don't have contamination, you only have this kind of thing, and what you, what you can do is that you just plot this, this relation and fit a line to it, and then you use this line as a weighting scheme, right? So you just upweight your, um, uh, your, your galaxies uh, according to the stellar density. Um, 
this is also analog. Uh, this, it, there is, it, this is just the same thing as you cross-correlating your stellar density template with your objects, right? So basically, uh, if you just, uh, just, just do a cross-correlation between two maps, these two maps, you get uh, the, this kind of weights. You can estimate beta. And this is what, uh, uh, for instance, uh, David Alonso was uh, talking in his, uh, in his talk about mode deep projection. Basically, what you do is that you cross-correlate with a template, and you get an estimate of this beta, and you subtract it, this thing. Okay. So this is how you do it. And it works if you only have contamination and if you only have uh, obscuration. But if you have both things at the same time, this, this approach doesn't work. And I'll show you just an example to drive the point home. Suppose that you balance the obscuration and the contamination exactly. So uh, in the sense that uh, you, in, on average, you remove the same number of galaxies as you put back as stars. Okay. So in this case, I can compute the difference, the like uh, the difference between the observed sources and the mean number, of, uh, a mean number of observed sources, and you get something like. That. So you can see that uh, there is no extra term here. You are only modulating the true density contrast by a certain factor and this can tell you like what would be the effect of that is that you have a fake bias so basically if you don't correct for anything you would have a fake bias here modulating your your density and the point is so how people usually do this estimation of the contamination or obscuration they cross correlate so the observed number of sources with your stellar density template and if you calculate this, so you see that this uh, goes up and down around zero. So this integral goes to zero. And you say, oh, there is no contamination. There is no obscuration in my sample. OK, but that's not true. So because of these two effects happen at the same time, and you are removing objects, actually replacing objects, I call this usurper contamination. OK, so basically, you replaced the true, uh, true tracer of the large scale structure by a fake one. So you have to be careful. OK? So just uh, show it in a more quantitative way. So here I'm using the uh, classification of uh, white supercosmos sources according to SDSS to estimate the contamination. So here I have the number of uh, sources that uh, in, in white supercosmos that were classified as stars according to SDSS as a function of galactic latitude. So you can see for all the redshift bins, uh, you can see more or less the same behavior, right? So it increases in, uh, in, uh, towards the center. And I just fitted an exponential model to it, OK? And the interesting thing now is that, so how, OK, how can you measure then uh, obscuration? So the, my proposal is to use the variance uh, of this of the galaxy of the objects, right? So the fact that uh, obscuration, uh, it's mo a multiplicative effect. You're actually decreasing the amplitude of your fluctuations, right? So you can see here, if you, if you have a factor here, you, this go, go, goes up and down, and this gets modulated to go up and down in a, in less, uh, in a smaller uh, uh, range, right? So here, I can compute then the variance uh, uh, for uh, regions with a fixed uh, value of the stellar template or stellar density. And actually, I call this uh, cosmological variance because I just removed the shot noise uh, contribution to it, OK? And you can see that it, is, it is scales like this. And here, I have the plot of this var Actually, I'm plotting here the standard deviation of this uh, uh, cosmological uh, uh, variation, right? And it should be constant, right? Because uh, our universe is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, so you, the variance should be the same everywhere, approximately. Of course, there'll, there'll be variations. But you can see the same a pattern going to the plane. You can see that the, uh, the, 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 the variance goes down, right? And one interesting, also interesting thing is that this line here is I, it's just a one parameter fit, OK? So it's this fit here. I, oh, sorry, it's actually a two parameter fit because there is, I have to fit for this uh, 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 galaxy density here and also this alpha parameter. But the template, uh, which actually gives you this shape, is not determined by these blue points here. It's determined by the contamination. So by, by 
when you see that the red line goes through the blue points, you can see that the, uh, the hypothesis that the, the both obscuration and contamination follow the same template, template is a good, uh, is a good uh, hypothesis, right? Okay, so there is a problem here is that uh, a cross match with STSS, I can only cover certain regions of the sky, only the northern hemisphere. So how do I deal with that? So uh, one idea is to go for a, a, a stellar density map that covers the whole sky. So I used Gaia's observation, uh, data release two, to create this uh, stellar density template here. So now there's no information from uh, Supercosmos here anymore. It's just, uh, it, it's just in the, an independent map of galaxy, uh, stellar density. And then I, I plot again the, the variance of, uh, due to cosmological fluctuations, or what would be cosmological fluctuations, as a function of this stellar template value. And you also get a decreasing right, uh, uh, trend. When you go to uh, regions with higher stellar density, you have less variance. And you can see here the, the red line is the fit, and it works reasonably well. OK, so with all this information, how do you actually correct uh, your map for obscuration and contamination? So first, what you have to do is that you fit this kind of, so I, you start, sorry, you start with this kind of equation, you fit uh, this relation with for alpha, you use this value to invert this equation, right? So then I, I, I'm left, so this is what I would, so you take the observations, weighed by the, 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 uh, the obscuration factor here, and you get this kind of effect. And now, since uh, you don't have the effect of obscuration anymore, you can do the cross correlation that people usually use to measure contamination, co contaminants, right? So then you cross correlate uh, uh, the resulting map with uh, actually this template, the weighted template, and you can get a measurement of beta, and then you just subtract the beta and you have like this. So this is the, the final estimate of your true galaxy density, okay? Okay, so it's very, okay, I showed here just like the theoretical side, so I'll prove it to you that it works on simulations. So uh, I used Flask uh, to create simulations of galaxies, and it's not, it's hard to see here, but there is obscuration effect here as well. I, I decreased the number of galaxies near the galactic plane. And also I simulated stars using Flask as well, and you can see that you have a certain number of stars here near the galactic plane. And then you just sum the two things over and you have a map of sources that I don't know, it's a mixture of galaxies and stars, right? Okay, so third thing I used, uh, to, just to show that uh, you can cover the two uh, obscuration and uh, contamination parameters. So for all the beams I have, the true values are used in the simulations, and in, this is the mean of uh, several, like a thousand uh, rea uh, recoveries from, from a thousand realizations, so the mean value, right? So you can see that it agrees, you can trace the, the value pretty well here, and also for the beta, you can see it works uh, quite well. I actually I noticed a bias here. Um, uh, it tends to overshoot so it tends to overestimate the obscuration, and I believe this is the re for because of a few uh, approximations I made, like that the variance doesn't really depend on the size and shape of your of your the region you are estimating the variance, and that's not quite true. So, uh, but I didn't care much about this because I'll show you later. It doesn't impact the the results. So I, I thought I I consider this bias okay. Um, another thing to point out is that uh, these fiducia parameters I used in the simulations are the parameters I measured from Y supercosmos. And if you compare with the, the error here, you can see that it's several uh, sigma away from zero. So that that's all actually shows uh, in a quantitative way that I could uh, determine there is obscuration and there is contamination uh, in, the, in the sample. So here is the effect on the uh, on a CL on an angular power spectrum. Uh, actually, I measured for all the CLs or the, uh, the in the sample, but I'm just showing the cross uh, correlation between beams three and four. And the black line is the true CL, and 
here, first of all, oh, actually, and the other lines are averages over simulations, right? And the shaded region is the t standard deviation you expect. So if you don't clean, if you don't do anything with your CLs, you can see you have a huge increase in power on the larger scales. And this is due to contamination, right? And on this, this bottom line, I show the fractional difference between the recovered CL and the true CL, and not only it overshoots, it's so big that it overshoots the scale here, but you can see that even in small scales you have a decrease in power, and this is an effect of obscuration, okay? You lose, as I showed you, is it acts like a fake bias on your galaxy, so it, it, uh, it underestimates here. So one thing you can do is do contamination cleaning with uh, just uh, cross-correlation as people usually do, and what you get is this blue line here. So you can see that you get the shape right of your power spectra, but you get a constant bias offset, okay? About 15% uh, if you just clean the, the contamination. So if you do the full cleaning process as I showed, then you get the red line and you can get a pretty decent estimate of your power spectra. So what is the effect on the cosmological parameters? So I ran MCMC uh, chains uh, for many parameters. So this uh, dashed black uh, line are priors that I used on uh, H, uh, amplitude, and uh, the spectral index, so don't care much about these plots here. But you can check the other ones, and the blue line gives you the true value, and the red line gives you one uh, for when you estimate your parameters without cleaning your sample, and the, the kind of yellowish uh, curve, thick curve, shows when you clean, right? So an important uh, feature is this one. You can see that if you don't clean um, your sample, you underestimate the density of dark matter. And the reason is that you increase the power on the larger scales, you're actually changing the slope of your power spectrum, and that's kind of the effect that you get from uh, dark matter, from you having less dark matter, okay? Um, Another important thing to point out are the biases. So as I showed, if you don't correct, you get a different uh, estimate for your bias, right? Uh, I think I have a too big head here. Okay. Um, okay, so, ah, and sigma eight, you also get a, a huge, so these are just uh, width of the Gaussian, uh, the photo Z, photo Z of the Gaussian distribution here that I use uh, to describe the, 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 the redshift distribution inside the bin, so nuisance parameters. And you get also a, a different uh, estimate for a sigma H, right? Okay, so, but to do this kind of analysis on simulations is kind of easy because, for instance, the template I use to create the simulations is the same I used to uh, measure it, right? And that's not the, the, in reality, that's not what you would have. Of course, the better you get the, your template, the better you get your data, but uh, uh, there will always be some mismatch, right? So to test uh, if this actually works on real data, so I'll show you the results from Y Supercosmos, right? So uh, this plots, I have the CLs for uh, many, all the redshift bins, I actually excluded the first one because as I showed, uh, my modeling wasn't working very well for the first bin, but uh, so this is the autocorrelation for the uh, num bin number two, this is the autocorrelation, no, the cross-correlation between bins two and three. And first, I will, and so the red uh, uh, lines here and points show the unclean uh, power spectra and the blue shows the clean. First thing I like to point out is that you see on larger scales, you, you decrease by cleaning, you decrease the amount of power, okay? And here, this is a bin, uh, bin CLs, uh, so basically all that uh, structure I showed in the simulations is just compressed into one or two bins. Uh, so you don't see very much of the difference, but you can see how uh, significant decrease in power you get by cleaning, by removing the contamination. So this is the effect of removing contamination. But you can see that, especially in this last bin or the fourth bin, uh, you don't really get uh, a perfect cleaning. In this case, you don't clean at all. So that's a problem of a template mismatch, right? or maybe some other systematics that's not related to stellar density. Another thing that you can see is that when you clean, you also change the overall scale of the power spectrum. And this is an obscuration correction, right? So you can see in most cases, you increase the power when you clean 
uh, your data. And the black line shows the best fit, but this is the best fit between these two dashed lines here. And the reason is that beyond this line here, I have nonlinear uh, 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 scale. Uh, non it, those are nonlinear scales, so I, I didn't want to include extra uh, problems I could have, so I just fitted the linear scales. And also the fact that this, this kind of uh, uh, process didn't work for the, for the last beans, I just decided to do the fit for this region here, okay? Um, and it's important to, to point out actually that I, I'm just showing the results for the northern hemisphere of Y supercosmos and not using full sky. And the reason is that I found out uh, during the analysis that there is likely more, I'm finishing, there is likely more, more systematic effects apart from stellar contamination in the southern hemisphere. So that's why. I just use the northern hemisphere here. So just to show it, so the results on the cosmological parameters, uh, here uh, you have when you don't clean the data, so you can see that, oh, so this is the red point here, the red contours are from Planck. So you can see if you don't clean the data, you get like very far away con con uh, contours. When you clean the data, you move the contours in the right direction, but uh, since I have this, this kind of Point. If I exclude at this point, I'm pretty sure I could get the much better data, but since I didn't exclude, you still, you still get this kind of contours here. Uh, and when you remove the, all the points below these this lines here, then you get something cons uh, uh, consistent with Planck. So conclusions. Photometric surveys, they suffer from usurper contamination. So it's not just a matter of adding, adding stars to your survey or removing galaxies. Actually, you're replacing uh, true, uh, tracers of, uh, true tracers of uh, large-scale structure with fake ones, okay? Um, you should measure uh, stellar contamination properly. So first, you have to com correct for obscuration, as I showed, especially if you want to measure galaxy bias, okay? Because uh, that's, that's the main, uh, main parameter that gets affected by this process. Uh, and uh, here's a, just a, a proposal. Let's try to make the larger scales usable and by, by tacking, tack, tackling systematics because there are important and relevant information there. And if you are interested in Y Supercosmos catalog, uh, beware that there is the presence of other systematics besides stellar related ones. And those are probably more uh, um, uh, constrained or restricted to the southern hemisphere. And the reason is that there are two telescopes, one probing the, the north hemisphere, one probing the south hemisphere. And maybe probably there was something wrong with the south setup. So if you want to check more about this, uh, you can check the archive paper. Just upload it. OK. That's it. Thanks, Henrik. So do we have questions? So there's this like 15% bias uh, that you showed if you cleaned in the normal way. This is what you said? Yeah. Um, does that mean we're getting 15% bias in all the like LSS measurements in DES since that's how we cleaned it? Yeah, well, that's, that would be, so not, not, not I, don't, I wouldn't think so because uh, uh, DES has a, like 1% contamination. Whereas Supercosmos can reach, and uh, well, and there are two things. So one thing is that the average contamination in Y Supercosmos is like 4% or, or 5%. So it's a lot more. Moreover, the region I, Y Supercosmos cover, it gets closer to get the galactic plane, so you increase even more. So near the galactic plane, you can get to 20% contamination. So probably uh, such a huge uh, effect here such a huge, huge effect. But my suggestion, actually I suggested this in a DS telecon, to check if you have uh, this kind of effect, because you could be slightly biasing your biases measurements. But uh, I, I wouldn't think it's such a big effect, no. Do we have more questions for Hickey? I, I have one. Have you, have you tried this, uh, there is a paper on uh, with uh, joining wise and true mass photometry to do star galaxy exploration. They have this 
with just one color, it's amazing. It can it can do things separate very amazing. Um, it's it's also Kovacs is and is a is a Poodle, I Yeah, think. it's a. I think it's a machine learning algorithm, right? They 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 try against it, but in the end, I think they only use some sort of index like W one minus J to okay. to separate star, and maybe you you could increase your sample, right? And 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 and. Uh, because yeah. you, 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 you match it to the slow one, right? You know, yeah. uh, to use as a truth table. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you, are you talking about using two mass? Yeah, there is, it's wise plus two mass that they use to separate stars and galaxies. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I think the problem is that two mass is a, is a lower redshift uh, survey, so you, you cannot get as far as, as you, you would need. Okay. But, uh, yeah. No further questions. So let's thank Henrique again. Thank you. Henrique. Okay, so uh, we are do I need this? So we are coming to the end of this workshop. And before the end, I really want to thank the uh, people that make this thing happen. So this is Jandira, Umberto, Lucas, and Joe. They're really great. Without them, this would not have happened. Okay, so thank you very much. So um, I hope you enjoyed the workshop and uh, yeah, happy holidays <laughs> and uh, have a safe trip home. So thank you and maybe we'll see each other in another opportunity. Thank you very much for coming, okay? And we do have coffee, so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.